I'm so excited to be joined by Reed Hoffman today to talk about his new book, Super Agency, What Could Possibly Go Right With Our AI Future. Now, folks, if you don't know who Reed is, he is an American internet entrepreneur. He is the founder of LinkedIn and Inflection AI, and I'm so excited to have him here today. So, Reed, I, I just want to kind of take a step back and briefly touch on why you're writing this book in the first place. Could you give readers and people who are watching just a quick overview of the book and what they should expect if they were to buy it? So if you look at a lot of the dialogue today around AI, it's like AI uncertain, AI skeptical, AI fearful. And what I'm trying to do is help people understand why they should be AI curious, why it is that AI will actually, as opposed to the worries about decreasing their agency, whether it's privacy of data, jobs, other things, it will actually increase their agency and why they should be, they should get involved and what they kind of, why this is a rational and, and kind of helpful perspective for them to have comparing with the history of kind of general technologies and also, you know, how AI might engage in their life in some way. And so that's, that's, that's the reason why to write the book, have conversations like this one, other things as ways, as, as ways of doing it. No, that makes sense. And I guess from like an ordinary American perspective, who doesn't really know much about AI or this type of technology, because it's very new. Um, why should ordinary Americans be optimistic about AI and um, what should they be worried about, if anything? Well, the, the principal reason to be optimistic is we have line of sight with AI agents today on a medical assistant uh, on your phone that's better than a good GP, that average, like, like, a, like a good average GP um, on that's available 24-7. You know, you have a child, you have a a sibling, you have a parent, you know, a pet, it can help you with that. A tutor on every subject for every age. Uh, and also something that can help you in anything from mundane tasks, like, hey, I've got these ingredients, what should I make for dinner? To like more tricky ones. Uh, hey, I'm going to have a difficult conversation with a family member, how should I approach it? Or how do I, you know, what kind of, uh, what's, what are the jobs of the future? What are the ways that I could possibly be well set for those? And, you know, as a founder of LinkedIn, that's one of the ones I also particularly focused on. And so that's all in the why be optimistic, why look for this in the future in terms of how you operate. Now, uh, in terms of risks and uncertainties, people will imagine many. And so they won't start playing with it. And you should go start playing with it. You should start seeing it. Now, I think, you know, part of it is you have to be, you know, these are still under development. And sometimes it may tell you something that's not exactly the right answer. If they're not the you know, universal oracles of truth. Sometimes they're trying to give you an answer just like a human being. They will, technological term, hallucinate. And so if something really important, you might want to cross-check it. You might want to go, you know, consult other experts, et cetera. But it's, um, uh, generally speaking, there is nothing that's scary about starting to go try and use it. My next question, I think that all makes sense. Um, but there there has been significant interest in AI right now, especially deep seek open AI. I mean, it's been in the news every day. And a lot of people are talking about how this technology, if in the hands of bad actors, could be used to harm Americans. So my question is, how should society balance the need for innovation through AI with the threat of it being weaponized in harmful ways? So part of the thing about, you know, people need to understand about the uh, building of AI is it's being built in many areas around the world. Now, most especially China, um, as well as um, the U.S., and as such, you know, we only have, you know, essentially some limited ability to direct this. And I think that, you know, the, the ways that it can be weaponized, you know, are serious. Uh, Cybercrime, a bunch of other things. Um, part of what we're going to need is we're going to need AI for defense. It's part of the reason why, you know, kind of, you know, building and continuing to accelerate in terms of building the future actually really matters. Um, I do think that you should, you should be now extra careful about whether you get a text or an email that seems to be actually, in fact, from your friend, colleague, you know, family member, and is like, I, I need five thousand dollars right now. Please help me. You know, be be more careful about that. And I think the that you know the various forms of weaponization will happen. The important thing is to have AI be part of the defense. So, like you can imagine, like okay, I've got a phishing phone call from a criminal using an AI pretending to be your you know your your sibling. And um, and then an AI, you know, your AI interrupts and says, you know, hey, this is a kind of a little odd. Why don't you ask some questions 
that only you and your sister would know in order to really make sure, you know, in order to make sure this is right. And so I think that's part of it. But, you know, this is this is just like lots of things, you know, cars can be weaponized, other things. It doesn't just the fact that it can be weaponized doesn't mean it isn't an essential technology for really massively improving, you know, hundreds of millions of lives. It just means that we need to build and steer, you know, with some attention to what are the ways to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks. Now that makes sense. And I think another question a lot of my viewers specifically have and um, are interested in is kind of the way AI interacts with the modern social media landscape. And you're the founder of LinkedIn, which is a massive social media company. And right now, there are a lot of talks about the dangers of other social media platforms, whether it be TikTok and the China influence or X and Elon Musk possibly influencing the algorithm there. Are you concerned that some of the most potentially dangerous people or entities are in control of so many people's time and minds and kind of what we're viewing on a day-to-day -day basis? And how can AI help or really hurt that? Well, I think one of the things that we should ask uh, for all the developers is, you know, kind of some kind of transparency about how they're actually, you know, running their, you know, kind of AI algorithms, um, you know, and algorithms in general. I think we should have them validate those with their auditors. Um, so, you know, whether it's questions about whether a person like Elon is, you know, kind of directing, you know, all of the Twitter algorithms to program his own tweets and the people he likes and, and kind of operating that way, that should be something that's reflected with honesty and transparency, you know, uh, kind of uh, supported by third party auditors. And I think that's true for all of the entities. And I think that's part of the thing that we should be, you know, kind of getting to. Now, I think that the, you know, that the, the need for regulation that is relatively modest, it's just simply say, hey, here's a set of, of questions that um, you should, you know, have as a kind of a, a, a statement about how you're running your product to the public, and then you should have your auditors, you know, kind of validate that statement. Um, and by the way, then, you know, um, individuals, consumers, societies can make their choices about what they want to engage in or not. They may want to engage in a fact that there's a platform to, you know, kind of says, actually, in fact, we're, you know, mammothly, you know, kind of uh, uh, having the algorithm, you know, work in these ways, <laughs> right? And uh, and that would be something that they would go, you know, that's fine. That's what I want to participate in. And that's, I think, part of being, you know, open, part of being, you know, free, democratic, et cetera. And I think that that's the way to navigate those kind of things. Got it. Got it. And, and kind of digging more into the book itself. Um, in Super Agency, you advocate for steering towards a better future via what you call a techno-humanist compass. Could you describe what that means to just an average person? <laughs> yeah. Well, so... Part of the thing to think about is, you know, part of what technology does is it helps us navigate in the future. And one of the ways that I describe AI in super agency is it's an informational GPS. Just like a GPS helps you figure out, you know, how to get to your friend's house or how to get to the restaurant or how to get to home or anything else. You know, an informational GPS helps you navigate all of this kind of like questions around like, well, I have this rash and, you know, is that something I should go to the emergency room for? Or, you know, um, you know, how should I understand you know, what's going on right now and, you know, Industry X or, you know, any number of, of, of informational spaces, because we as human beings navigate informational spaces constantly. That's what you and I are doing right now, having a conversation. And so, uh, so you have AI as an informational kind of GPS. And what a techno-humanist compass is, is to say, hey, with technology, let's have it elevate, you know, my agency, my capabilities as kind of a human being, both individually and you know, kind of socially. And so have that kind of humanist compass in the, you know, in mind, in the technologies we build them and also, and what we expect for and what we ask for technologies, you know, as we operate. And I think that's, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, that's what a, the, the big word of techno humanist compass, but it's that kind of informational GPS trying to help you make, you make your life better and make better decisions and, and to do better things. Makes sense. And I guess to kind of close out, and, and the final question I have for you is, someone who knows nothing about AI or this technology, why should they be a reader? Why should they buy it? And if they do buy it, what's kind of the biggest takeaway after finishing Super Agency that you would want someone to have? 
So I think one of the important things is to become AI curious. Sure. Namely, what can it do for me? What can it do for, for my family, my job, my work, et cetera? And part of what Super Agency is trying to do is show you how to take that kind of sense of agency, how to start, not a how-to book, but like the kind of a mindset for how to approach it. And that gaining that AI curiosity won't just make you, you know, happier and more enabled, but will also start you learning about this key new technology that's going to be shaping industries and societies and the world and help you participate in it, both in terms of your own learning, but also when you kind of say, hey, I really like this, I don't like that. You know, that's part of how companies, the people building these things learn. And so, you know, super agency is to help you become AI curious. Well, Reid, thank you so much for having this conversation with me and folks who are watching this. If you are not curious yet and this helped you become curious, go buy super agency uh, today. Go become AI curious like Reid has been talking about. I think it's so important. Um, so, Reid, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. Always.